beautiful flowers in winter, some florist secrets, and much more to brighten a winter day coming up next. Smith, welcome to the show. You know, this is one of my favorite spaces to be in during the winter when I can't go outside or work under my loggia. You know, today I thought I'd bring you a big burst of sunshine in the way of some of these flowers that I picked up at the florist. Now, these are okay, but wait till you have a look at this. You see, these are flowers growing on a flower farm. These are self-pollinating ranunculus, and a little later we'll hear about this amazing display of color. While we're on the subject of explosive color, you won't want to miss the latest innovations in plant breeding. This is a proven winner right here, and I love it. They call it a super tunia, and that's an appropriate name for a plant that's so prolific. We've got many more of these to show you. Now, as you may know, I've been working on an environmentally friendly house and garden called the Garden Home Retreat, which I have loved working on, and I've got some very innovative ideas I want to share with you. For instance, this radiant heat system is not only going to warm my basement floors, but heat the hot water and help with other applications. We'll talk with an expert about this coming up. Plus a recipe just right for the season. We'll step into the kitchen, so stick around. Sweeping layers of color cascade down the side of a ridge in Carlsbad, California. It's a sight to behold for sure. While ranunculus like these are stunning from a florist, it's hard to beat this vivid display of fresh from the garden flowers. Michael Cordoza, the farm manager, tells us a little bit about these blooms. So Michael, how did the ranunculus find its way to Southern California? Well, the crop originated here in Carlsbad by an English horticulturist by the name of Luther Gage. He brought seeds here from England and started producing ranunculus in the Carlsbad area about 70 plus years ago. Uh, his irrigator was a gentleman by the name of Frank Frizee, who had a young boy whose name was Edwin Frizee. Edwin was known as the flower field's father. Edwin produced that crop someplace here in coastal North County for about 60 plus years. The flower fields that we see here today are an extension of their work that was started 70 years ago. That's correct. It's been a year after year hand selection for those properties that we're looking for. And how many acres of ranunculus are in bloom here today? 53 acres and it's principally made up of ranuncula production. We do have some other specialty crops and also the theme gardens. The color here from the ranunculus is sort of the inspiration that's driven the vivid imagination. So what are you looking for in an ideal bloom? Well this would be an example of the kind of qualities that we're looking for here in the ranunculus. We're looking for a very, very full, beautiful, full, heavy petaled flower, nice size. That is amazing. You know, there's such a range here of flower shapes. Uh, I mean, this one is very different from that one. So 70 years of breeding and production, and the work goes on. What can we expect in the future? Just absolutely continued gorgeous color, Alan. We're just gonna achieve the best color we possibly can. As if that weren't enough color, we've got more spectacular blooms ahead. It's the perfect way to spend a winter afternoon, don't you think? More of these beauties after the break. Talk about flower power. Just look at this little guy. This is Euphorbia Diamond Frost sure to bring a smile to your face. You know, I visited Southern California a few months ago and saw so many wonderful things in bloom. There I visited with Jerry Church of Euro America about some plants that are absolute showstoppers. Jerry, I gotta hand it to you. The color here is fantastic. It's color on top of color and then some more color. I know, and that's the way we like it. Well, there's, there's no doubt about it. The more color you have in the garden, the, the prettier it looks. <laughs> well, I think it well, attracts everyone. <laughs> but you know, we've got a lot of other nice plants around here that add accent to, uh, to the beautiful color that we've got. Well, you know, the, what's interesting to me is that you, you layer the color 
not only with bloom but foliage, which is so important. And then if you look at the individual plants, you've got the display, but then the individual plants like these Rocapulco impatiens, I mean, there's hardly room for leaves. There's so many more. Exactly. I'll tell you, I saw these last year in Michigan during the summer, and they were just gorgeous out there. And What's fantastic about this is it doesn't even look like an impatience. No, it's, it's a double form of impatience. Rockapocos are just a, really some of the best genetics out there in the market. And it's what we try to do here is bring the best of a, the best there is. You know, I think what's so beautiful about a plant that's so floriferous like this is it's the perfect combination plant for foliage plants, such as the hostas. They have such broad, gorgeous leaves. And then on the flip side of the hosta, you have ferns with their very delicate leaves, like a Japanese painted fern would be gorgeous with these rockapultos. Absolutely, absolutely. These things fit in with so many wonderful plants we have out there. And just look at the colors of these. There's actually five different colors of this Rockapulco oh, series. Oh, really? Okay. And, and they'll fit into almost any garden and any place. And it's a, just a wonderful shade plant and mixes well. Gosh, Jerry, everything out here just looks fantastic as usual. Well, thank you. We, uh, we take pride in uh, this garden that we, uh, we, we plant every year to bring the public in to see it and bring all of our customers well, in. Well, I mean, it is such a crowd pleaser, and this fabulous petunia is one of my all-time favorites. Well, I'll tell you, it's one of my favorites, too. Supertunia Vista Bubblegum makes a beautiful vista, as you can see here, here, but more importantly, it works well just as one plant in the garden, too, as complements to other, other nice plants out there. This is just gorgeous stuff. Oh, this is this is a wonderful plant. This comes from a breeder down in Colombia. Really? Uh, and it's and it's uh, it's a euphorbia, but we call it uh, diamond frost, and it does exactly that. It looks like a diamond. Well, it's hard to imagine this being related to the poinsettia, but they are both euphorbias. Exactly, they are. And if you break a poinsettia stem, you see that little, slight little bit of white sap come out. Yeah, you can see the sap coming out of it just like it does with a poinsettia. Absolutely, and you know there, there's hundreds of different types of euphorbias. Some of them even look like cactus. It's such a wide and varied family, isn't it? Absolutely, and there's been a great deal of hybridizing done on that. I mean, to the poinsettia, when you, if you looked at that when it first uh, came on the market, it wasn't very pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From plants that are great solutions in the garden to ideas that are money savers in the house, we'll go out to the Garden Home Retreat for a look around next. Senorita Rosalita is also known as the spider flower, or sometimes called cat whiskers. The dark green foliage and the bright pink lavender blooms of Senorita Rosalita Cleone add beauty and charm to your gardens by adding height and amazing color that have absolutely no thorns. You see, some of the old fashioned varieties had really pernicious thorns on them. This heat and drought tolerant plant prefers well drained soil and full sun. Now, I know you may be wondering what this strange looking apparatus is. Well, actually, this plays a very important role in our earth friendly home, the Garden Home Retreat. You see, this is a cross section, an illustration, a model, if you will, of how we put radiant heat in the house. Just take a look at what these guys are doing. They're snaking this plastic tubing along this reflective material. And once the metal roofing is laid on top, it will transfer heat into the solution that runs through these tubes. Bill Palatowicz of Don Solar, the company who came up with this particular system, stopped in during the installation to tell us what we can expect from using radiant heat. You know, when we started this project, I wanted to create an 1830s style house, but I also wanted to make it as green as possible. And the idea of having solar collectors up on the roof made me feel like the house might look like a spaceship. So when I discovered that there's actually an alternative to that where you can use solar energy, I got pretty excited. What you have here is a building integrated solar thermal system. Really is the trend in the industry. This is a roofing underlayment in and of itself is a water barrier. So we have water barrier number one. Next step in the process is a radiant reflective membrane. This aluminized material here goes down. This creates a thermal break so that we are keeping the thermal energy out of your house, keeping your house cooler in the summer. And it's another water barrier. Then the purlins go down. Purlins are engineered to meet the specific requirements of this job. They can be put in on very 
various spacings. Then the tubing's laid in. I was out here when they put in the tubing. It was fascinating to see them pounding the tubing in between these purlins. Yeah, this is a uh, very unique purlin here. It's not something that you'll find in your local hardware store. It's designed to accomplish a very snug housing of that tubing. We use what's in the industry called a home run. It starts below the roof at a manifold. It flows up through eight or ten purlins and then flows back below the roof with no penetrations, no connections. So you've got a real sound and integral construction at that point. You can see where they all come together and meet right there and then head into the basement of the building. What's the most exciting energy benefit to the system that comes to mind? It's the concept I think that most people are comfortable with. This day and age of escalating oil prices and escalating gas prices, a homeowner is in essence pre-buying 50 years worth of energy with this installation and you're locking the price in today for the kilowatt hours that you might otherwise have to use to heat your hot water. You're locking in your kilowatt hour price at two or three cents below what you're paying today and you'll pay that for the next 50 years. Yeah, that's outstanding. In this case here, it's going to be about 8,000 pounds of carbon a year. Really? That this system will offset. Oh, that is tremendous. And just roll that out 50 years. Gardens are a constantly changing palette and also a unique way to reconnect to the past. We caught up with Kathy Roberts in her garden to hear how it's changed since her family started renovating it and how she's using it as a way to keep the spirit of her gardening ancestors alive. We started this garden in about 1996. So we started out with the pool, the pond for the goldfish, and the first Japanese maple. And then I began adding more Japanese maples because I particularly like them. So I chose them according to their spring color, their fall color, and their height so that they would fit in this space and they would all be different. So I now have 12 of them most of them are back here in the shade because they do well in this area. And then I began filling in with azaleas. I do enjoy having things that are handed down from generations and I also enjoy things that friends have given me and I have a lot of that. I have, besides the hydrangea from my grandmother, I have a fig bush from her and from my other grandmother, a peony. So it, it's a nice thing to have and remember and to share. I do in, enjoy gardening and it's, it was sort of unexpected. I didn't know I was going to, but as I began working in the garden, I started remembering being a child in my grandmother's garden and the names of the plants were still there, things she had talked about. To be able to have brought plants from her garden to mine really means a lot to me. Up next, a fresh from the garden recipe that will taste oh so good on a cold winter day. All right, today we're gonna to do an incredible soup recipe. It's a cucumber shrimp soup with a dill and shallot cream. Great, great fresh ingredients we've got coming from the garden. Cucumbers, tomatoes, dill, and garlic. All right, let's get started on the recipe. We've got sour cream, we've got the white pepper and salt, we have the fresh dill, and we have the chopped shallots. Then we're gonna get a spoon, two tablespoons of white wine, preferably dry, and we're gonna mix this up. This right here is gonna be the garnish for the soup. So once we're done with the soup, we're gonna plate the soup and put just a dollop of this cream in the, in the center and it's gonna take it to another level. We've got a medium heat going. Let's get started on the soup. We've got two tablespoons of butter. We're gonna saute our shallots, chopped shallots garlic, yellow onion, and fresh dill. All right. We want to saute for about two minutes. Now that we've got these vegetables translucent, we're going to get the salt and white pepper, add that. Some fresh tomatoes, diced. And the cucumber, which are halved, peeled, halved, and then thinly sliced. And we're gonna saute this for about a minute. Now we're gonna add the four cups of chicken stock. Then we're gonna go to our two cups of heavy cream. Now, now it's official, you know it's gonna be good. 
We're gonna let these simmer, let all this simmer for about 20 minutes. Let the flavors marry and then we're gonna add the shrimp. All right, after simmering about 20 minutes, we're gonna now add some shrimp. If you use a larger shrimp than what we have here, just you can cut it up in smaller pieces to make it easier, bite-sized pieces. After adding the shrimp, it only takes a few more minutes. You don't wanna overcook them. And this is, I mean, fresh from the garden soup right here. During this time of the year, I like to bring in a few fresh flowers, but I'm not interested in big overblown arrangements. Just a single bundle of flowers like these ranunculus can be very effective, just cleaned up and a few of them placed in a single vase. What I have here are five vases that are exactly the same size. And what I'm doing is I'm just putting a couple of stems of these ranunculus in them. It's a beautiful and simple way to display this gorgeous flower. I also like to use other flowers the same way. Try tulips, even hyacinths. They're so fragrant. You know what's interesting about the ranunculus is that we actually have them growing wild. They're referred to as marsh marigolds, uh, sometimes called buttercups. These are the hybrid or improved varieties that the florist covet. But the wild ones, they're much simpler. Now if you give this a try, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Keep the flowers away from a direct source of sunlight, keep them away from sources of heat, and keep the water clean. And they'll last so much longer. And in terms of displaying, I've used five vases that look the same, but you can use bottles or any sort of favorite vase collection you might have. Give it a try. It's a great way to brighten up your house during the winter. And don't forget about using ranunculus in your garden during the spring. There's a color that can work with any color theme you may have going on. They truly are a magnificent flower. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And remember, when spring arrives, think about adding some of these showstoppers like the diamond frost euphorbia, the super tunia vista bubblegum pink, and those Rocapulco impatience. You won't regret it. And also, any information you saw on today's show, whether it's that delicious recipe or information on radiant heat, you can find it on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream Of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing Of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile